This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us. With me today is Richard Fields, John Cameron, and Mr. Mr. Tom Taylor. Is it pronounced Tom? It's just yes. Tom, right? Yeah, okay. I yeah. forgot to get through that before we started. So, all right, gentlemen, let's just start right off the bat here. Um, Tom, you're economics, right? You're the... Well, yeah, that's been my background. I, I, I studied economics at UC Berkeley, got my MBA at USC, and um, eventually found my way in the Libertarian Party. Or as Gary Johnson would say, you know, you're a Libertarian, you just don't know it. So finally kind of got revealed to me in that in that presidential cycle. <laughs> Great. Well, then you're the man we want to talk to. Well, Who should be right. paying this economic damage for the CDC's rent control moratoriums? I think there's a lawsuit going by the Pacific Legal Foundation, I think, that's trying to decide... You know, how does the CDC actually have the power to force people to stay in their homes, I guess? It's a strange... Well, no, for, not force people to stay in their homes. Force them or allow them to stay in their homes without paying rent. Forcing the uh, the landlords to become effectively uh, donate their, their, their property for the length of the moratorium. Or paying their mortgages. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and maintain, yeah. Yeah. Keep paying the mortgage. Up, but yeah. Of course. I'm not too concerned with the banksters losing money, but no, I am. It's still, it's all immoral. But I'd rather see, you know, because because most people, um, you know, the rent out houses. A lot of people depend on rental income to survive. You know, they have a second home, yeah. and and that's paying for their lifestyle. So. Well, the, the the banks are holding up quite well during all. This. That's the. Uh, that's the, the other half of it. I mean, look, they can go through waves of evictions or whatever they need to do, and then they'll just take back properties as they did in, you know, 2009 downturn. So, um, yeah, and especially where where rates are, uh, you know, the, the slowly rising yield curve is going to be beneficial to the bank. So they've, they've thrived, you know. Um, but as far as who, you know, who, who's to blame, who's to pay? Uh, Trump wants China to pay ten trillion dollars. Not going to happen. But I would imagine there's going to be waves of lawsuits, you know, going on. Well, yeah. the specific lawsuit that we're talking about is a lawsuit by, brought by the Apartment Owners Association yeah. that uh, goes after the CDC, saying, "Hey, uh, we are effectively giving the use of our property." Uh, to renters who won't move out because they because of a, a CDC mandate saying you don't have to move out if you don't pay your rent uh, for the, for the, you know as long as the CDC says uh, the uh, the lawsuit is saying this is a taking which of course it is they're taking the use of private property. Mm -hmm. So is, is is California trying to get around that a little bit by doing this rental? Uh, buy up bailout that they're doing where they're going to be well yeah i mean there's a certain amount of money being made available with bailouts to you know administer through the states but it's not going to be enough to make up the arrearage in rents that have not been paid for the last more than a year now mm -hmm. and so and then the apartment owners association knows that and saying and the saying we want to be reimbursed in full they <laughs> took the use of our property in full we need to be paid in full the, the question is whether or not this should be done on the taxpayer's dime, uh, and, and and that's a tough one. Yeah, well, there's there's some ramifications of, of the taking because the if you look at at the reg, um, these the the people who aren't paying the mortgages and aren't paying the rent are still on the hook for it. That doesn't mean they're going to pay for it. So um, when that's going to be the that's going to be the government's out. That's going to be their excuse. Well, when the when the moratorium is over. The, the renters are responsible to pay any rent in arrears. So what, what the government's defense is, is, oh, no, we're, uh, we're not the person you need to go after. You need to go after the renters because we've simply given them a grace period. So uh, that's, the, that's the government's defense. Now, the, the other side of that is then um, it's still a lost income stream. And, and hopefully the, the, the recent... Um, the recent takings, winnings at the Supreme Court, another Pacific Legal Foundation case based upon uh, union organizers uh, having the right, according to California law, which has been overturned, to, to go onto property and disrupt it. 
pretty much anything is fair game for a taking now, which was the, the whole reason for Civic Legal Foundation taking that taking that case. So it's going to be interesting. And, and as we said, when this uh, when this uh, whole uh, pandemic started, the only people that are really going to make out are dogs. They're making out. Um, and uh, the banksters, if you, Tom, you've already talked about that, and bankruptcy uh, attorneys and basically all other attorneys. So, uh, you know, pretty much uh, everybody else is just screwed. So um, but it, it's going to be interesting as heck, and lawsuits are going to go flying, and, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, – you know, the, the government will, yeah, but then it's, again, it's us. They're just going to print the money. So there really are going to be no winners out of this thing. Uh, but I do know, as we were having a discussion before the show started, that, that cars will be a whole lot cheaper when they all get repossessed in January. So you'll be able to buy a car pretty cheap in January. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's a strange world we live in now where um, used cars are somehow more expensive than new cars. I know I just... A family member just bought one off the lot. Hadley took back her, her leased car for more money than she owed on it and got a new car. And it's, it's just it's a strange world we live in these days. We're, it, the economics have been so manipulated by government action that it, you can't trust what's going on anymore. You, yeah. you know, does anything actually function right anymore because everything is so manipulated? I don't know. Couldn't so, trust anything from, was it, what, what, what was the date of the, the, the Fed came into being? 1911, 1913? 13. We yeah. haven't been able to actually trust them since 13. They've just been doing a better job of hiding it until now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, t we'll talk about trusted manipulations. Um, it's, apparently, it's been discovered that adding the human gene can boost crop yields by 50%. Who knew? Now, of course, we do this. We all know the, the, the people who don't like this genetic modification stuff are going to have a cow about that. I'm kind of on the fence about these things of genetic modification personally. You know, I'm not one who's overly concerned about it, but I can respect people who are. What do you guys think about that? Well, I, it's interesting. It, it's, it's, the, it's a gene that suppresses growth. It's a human uh, gene that suppresses growth, and then also you inject that into, into plants, into rice and potatoes, where it's been demonstrated right uh, so far. It will Im increase the field yield, not the, not the lab results, but the actual yield in the field uh, of rice and potatoes by 50%. It mm -hmm. includes uh, a, a method of uh, increasing drought tolerance. It increases the number of uh, uh, rice grains on the stock of grain. It makes potatoes bigger. It, it, you know, it, it's a way of using the same amount of land and the same amount of seed grain to feed 50% more people when, you have, when it comes right down to it. And it looks like it will be transferable, not just to rice and uh, potatoes, but to other crops as well. And I say, hooray, uh, if people don't like GMOs, if they're afraid of GMOs, then go eat organic produce uh, made, you know, the old fashioned way. That's mm -hmm. your privilege and your right. But if you want to eat and you're not particularly worried about uh, Frankenfood uh, scaremongering, buy the cheaper food that is made in that particular way. I, I'm, I, I have no fear of, of uh, GMO seeds. We've been living with them for uh, decades now, and it's, in, it's already increased corn yields and, and other yields uh, by an order of magnitude. And we're feeding a lot more people than we would have been able to do otherwise. GMO is rescuing humanity from starvation on the edge. And I say that's a good thing. And I, I absolutely agree with, with Richard, which, you know, I, it just kind of sticks in my throat when I have to say that. But in this case, I absolutely do. And when, when you think about it, uh, humans have been genetically modifying um, uh, plants for consumption for, I think, about 6,000 years. Uh, since shortly after um, uh, humans became agrarian. It's just that they did it in a much less efficient uh, way than they do now by splicing in a gene. And in essence, they've, they've taken that thing when, when, uh, when a, a variety of, of wheat appeared, a variety of rice appeared that provided larger kernels of rice, or was more drought tolerant, or required less water, or was more um, resistant to uh, uh, to uh, 
whatever rice mold killed off crops, then, then farmers would to either to take the seed from that and propagate it and use that instead of the other seed, or they would cross pollinate um, that seed with a, another seed that had desired results. And we've been doing this for, I think, six or 7,000 years. But for, somehow that's good, that's okay. But if you go into to a laboratory and, and um, I hate the Franken food thing. It's hilarious, but I just hate that label. I don't want to call it Wonder Food, something I don't know, uh, and do it. It's somehow evil. And it's evil because uh, apparently uh, people think uh, that uh, natural is better. And, and um, everything that occurs in nature is natural. If it's unnatural, it can't occur. So, you know, once again, the left has is, is taken control of the, the stream and, and used words improperly. If it's unnatural, it can't occur in nature. If it's natural, it can't. So we're, we're simply being smarter about the process than, than uh, you know, the one we were before. And, and I'm pretty sure that there's no way you can eat the rice and that that gene is going to jump back into your chromosome structure and make you grow 50% bigger. Although in my case, it might not be a bad idea. Uh, I would then be slightly above normal height instead of, you know, chopping in the men's petite section. So, uh, and we've been doing it with people. You know, people. You you look at the the growth in people, not not just through through uh, uh, you know natural selection, but uh, the, there's a couple of NFL players out there right now whose parents brag about the fact that they've been breeding fast white boys. So. Um, it's, you know, do it with people, you, you feed them better, you put them in a better environment with less stress and they marry healthier, bigger people and they produce bigger people. So I, I don't know what the, uh, it's just, you know, anytime you get into a lab, that's the problem with having so many people get college degrees without any math associated with it or any science and they give them master's degrees and stuff and the only place they can get a job is in the government screwing with other people's lives. Okay, I'm on a rant. I'll stop now. Yeah, yeah, you're on the rant. <laughs> you got anything to add to that thing, to Tom? <laughs> oh no, I, I I just think what Richard said about the the choice. I mean, we're always given the the two bins in the grocery store of organic versus non, and you you can make that choice. So I don't see why um, why that's not more fostered as opposed to just saying, hey, we can't we can't apply this generally. I can understand the the kind of the fear of you know big business not paying attention to safety and all that, but yeah. but you know as long as we have the choice, as long as there's still diversity in choice, it, it will work out just better in the end. But something about something that hasn't worked out better in the end. Daniel Hale, who was a drone operator under the Obama administration, released publicly information about uh, how the drones were killing more innocent civilians than they were the people they were actually trying to kill. And he's now been sentenced to 45 months in prison for you know, releasing to for, – this is what gets me. is He released the information about an illegal government program, and he gets thrown in jail for it. It's, it's, we're, we're living a backwards world. It's just – it's insane. He should have got the Medal of Honor. I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, Edward Snowden all over again. This is somebody who is a whistleblower who is telling the truth to power and to the American people and getting – uh, thrown in the in the hokey for telling the truth. The truth w was that whenever uh, a drone strike hit, what was happening is whoever got killed in the drone strike, and this is on the, under the Obama administration, don't forget mm -hmm. that, uh, whoever was getting killed in a drone strike was automatically being classified as a militant, no matter if they were three years old or, or, or 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Everybody that got killed, by definition, was a militant. It was all a bunch of... Uh, after the fact justification, and it's absolutely amoral, immoral, uh, and 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 disgusting. Just one more artifact of how uh, morally compromised we as a country have become because of the forever wars in the Middle East. Tom, you well, I, you, you know, I just think the the flip side is that this draws so much more attention to it. Um, so while we can say, oh, this, this sentence is entirely unfair, 
um, you know, the, the, the subjects can become heroes in their own way and bring more uh, light, I guess, to the whole issue as a result of it, which is, you know, counterproductive for the people who are trying to suppress it. Um, you know, look at look look at Snowden. I, you know, he didn't set out to be this this kind of a hero uh, to truth tellers, but you know that I'm sure he's I'm sure he's very happy, even though you know he's had to live under uh, such scrutiny and and danger, frankly. Uh, yeah, I'll, I I agree with with Richard and Tom both. And then what what disgusts me there's there's enough to be discussed disgusted about what we've already said is that the defense. Uh, or, or the, the, the government asked, uh, told the judge that, that he should have an even longer prison sentence because his act endangered the brave soldiers of, of, uh, of our government who are fighting this war against terror. And fortunately, the judge didn't buy that. So, um, and, and I think, you know, even, and this, this probably is going to sound harsh, but this is what I think about it is, you know, there were probably some, some intelligence agents uh, that were put at risk by some of the re releases of the Snowden stuff. There, there certainly were in some, uh, um, you know, when, uh, what's her name, Hillary, uh, Hillary was running a, a server out of her home that had top secret uh, stuff from the State Department, and, you know, the Chinese got it, and the Russians got it, and probably the Iranians got it. Um, and, you know, some intelligence agents got killed there, but we haven't heard anything about it. But, and I'm sure that some of these people, uh, you know, maybe some of these drone pilots' names were released or something like that, and they're at risk. But um, my point is that when you do immoral things and kill children, and um, then you should be at risk. And your boss should be at risk. Uh, you should be at risk. And, and that's the right outcome for doing an immoral act and murdering people. And the other justification that they, the government did at the beginning of this thing was they said that, that these were people that we weren't able to arrest. And that's why we had to blow them up with drones. And I'm willing to bet if you looked at all of these cases, you would find with a, a little bit of footwork, uh, if these were indeed terrorists, that local authorities would have, for a few million dollars in bribes, uh, uh, been more than happy to hand these people over. Because uh, one of these drones are expensive. You know, you, either, you blow something up with a drone, I don't know what it is, like a million bucks a shot or something. Um, just take that money, bribe a local official, get the terrorist, Put them somewhere. If they really are guilty of a war crime, uh, have them have them sit through trial and have a sentence declared and perform whatever punishment needs to be. But saying, "Oh no, no, there we can't arrest these people," and that's why we need to blow them and some of their kids up. That's that's just crazy. It's immoral, and we shouldn't be doing it. Never should have done. It. Yeah, and who is actually putting these these soldiers at risk? It's not the people who release the. The information is the people who are asking them to do these immoral acts, and that's the it's our government officials who are actually putting these people at risk, not not whistleblowers who are saying, "Hey, our government's doing something illegal." It's the illegal acts, it's the illegal and immoral acts that are putting these people at risk, and, not you know, not the whistleblowers. The the whole idea that you have to do something in secret pretty much means that that there are uh, there are outcomes that you don't want people knowing about, and if you're not proud of what you're doing, um, probably shouldn't be doing. It. Well, we're gonna, well, so we're gonna stay in the area. Um, the, the mission in Iraq is supposedly ending for what the fourth time now. It's <laughs> are they ever actually gonna end this mission? No, uh, well, not not until we run out of um, uh, printed money, uh, newly printed money, uh, and and everybody knows that we've run out of money. Uh, George W. Bush said the war, uh, the the end of hostilities had happened. Uh, Obama said that. Uh, and so did uh, Trump, and now uh, Biden is supposedly pulling troops out, except he's not. All he's doing is he's changing the name. He's, he's, he's reclassifying troops as advice givers. Does anybody remember the advice givers that started out the Vietnam War? I'm old enough to remember that, because I'm older than dirt. So yes, you are. Plays it. But the point is, 
uh, we're not leaving. And the only reason we're staying is because the neocons and the military industrial complex uh, think that's a really good thing or a really profitable thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I've got a, I got a question on that topic. Um, I mean, it, 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 are, are we playing the strategy right to begin with, or should we just be saying, hey, if we're going to go in and stabilize this country, they become territories, you know, in the sense that <laughs> Guam is a territory or something like that. It's a return to colonialism, and of course it would never happen and would be criticized. But in a way, I think it's how you could create stability because you always have the sense that we're going to export our democracy and justice system and everything to these countries. And I don't know when that's happened. You know, they they, they have all they, no, they, they they're going to revert to their old old ways, um, and we're going to want to have our fingers in it, every every pie. So I think you're right, Richard. They just sort of are changing the name or giving some different impression to it, um, and it's the way that wars are going to be be fought. You know, going yeah, well, it's, it's a way to keep non what. Wars that don't particularly risk a whole lot of American lives, which uh, American, uh, the American involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. A lot of people have died there and have come back with PTSD, but it's not like Vietnam where just about everybody right. of the uh, uh, of the 20 uh, something generation was coming back damaged or dead. Uh, sure. This is a war that is relatively, relatively is, is the key word here, uh, inexpensive in terms of lives. Uh, it's very expensive in terms of weaponry, and that works just fine for the people who are selling weapons, and uh, it works just fine for the neocons who are uh, able to move back and forth between the halls of government and the halls of Northrop and Grumman and uh, Lockheed and, and, and the like, uh, you know, at, at high salaries. This is, it, it's, it's a, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex add education and uh, medical care to that, and you've got pretty much what's going on in this country right now. Well, I no, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tom, did I interrupt you? Uh, no, I was just gonna say, in terms of like the defense industry, when Biden won, uh, you know, I managed money for a living in the stock market, and people would say, well, what areas do you wanna, you know, should you focus on? And I said, the defense stocks. And they're like, really, under Biden? I thought Trump was the warmonger, and I'm like, no, the defense stocks have been under pressure and they're actually doing fine and they'll continue to do fine. So your Northrop Grumman's, your Raytheon's, those are those are all very stable kinds of stocks in this new administration. It's a sad thing, but it's the truth. Well, a lot of them pay nice dividends too. So, you know, what the heck. So I'm, I want to add something I always add when we have this discussion is there is an unspoken goal uh, in all these little wars we fight and that's to have blooded leadership and blooded troops. In other words, somebody who sent men into battle and had them killed, somebody who's gone into battle and had their buddy killed, somebody who's killed other people's buddies. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is that you, you can test the heck out of stuff and practice the heck out of stuff, but if, if you're troops and you go into battle against hardened practice troops, your chances of dying are way, way greater and the chance of the hardened battle test of troops are way, way lower. And this is never talked about, but we basically have a constant stream of blooded troops and blooded leadership going back to, uh, I think there's a little gap between World War II and the Korean War, but really since Vietnam, we've had our fingers in pies. Um, and, and it's, it's something nobody talks about. I think it would make a, a, a great master's thesis for somebody or a doctoral dissertation. But it's, it's an unspoken thing, you know, just like, uh, well, anyway, there's lots of unspoken things. So I uh, absolutely agree. You know, the, the, the bummer is, is that we ever, if based upon our prior performance, I mean, the, well, the translators that are that helped us fight the Taliban, and those people are quite frankly disgusting. If anybody deserves to be killed, it's them. But I'm not saying it's our job to do it. But um, they're medieval evil. I mean, they are bad people by any moral judgment other than their own perverted religious monstrosity. If we ever do need somebody's help in going somewhere, 
people are going to be reticent to give it, even if, if it is a morally just mission, because we've proven we'll go in, screw things up, and then leave, and you're going to be left there to fend for yourself. So if you were a translator, you or your kids are going to get beheaded. That's a pretty clear message that we have done over and over and over again. And that's also a bad thing. All right. Well, we've got a couple minutes left here, so we'll go on about uh, the panic demic here. The, the new Delta variants have soared, but they're kind of soaring based upon it's low numbers. So they're saying like the case have increased 300%, but well, it was from a really low. And yeah. some manipulated numbers that I think Richard wants to talk about. Yeah, I mean, you've got, if you if you uh, go from one case to two cases, that's a 100% increase. If you go from 99 cases to 100 cases, that's a 1% increase. 100% uh, sounds a lot more dangerous and scary than uh, 1%, but that 100% like John said, is based on a low number. Not only that, but the reporting has been very interesting. Uh, all of the reporting uh, for you know the headlines from about a week or so ago uh, came from a couple of, uh, from the reports, the, the, the Friday dump from Delaware and Florida. They, they announced all of their cases on Friday. And so you've got an entire week's worth of cases being put onto the, uh, onto the screen in one day, which makes that percentage increase look even worse than it is. If you look at an actual graph of the number of cases or the number of deaths, particularly the number of deaths, since the Delta variant is not as lethal uh, as, the, uh, as the original uh, variant, uh, it's not all that alarming. Uh, what's alarming is the fact that it's being used to scare people back into submission, back into lockdowns, back into wearing masks everywhere. Uh, we, you know, I, I got the vaccination. I'm in much in favor of getting the vaccination. I'm not worried about whether or not uh, it's a real vaccination or a genetic modification or whatever the heck it is. Uh, it works, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see that. Uh, but I, I respect the people who don't want to get the vaccination for whatever reason. And I also respect the people who are willing to risk their own lives by going unmasked uh, in the supermarket or wherever. What I don't respect is bureaucrats at the CDC or elsewhere saying, or the governor's office saying, uh, I think you're going to get in danger so you can't do a damn thing. Stay home and shut up. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and I think the fatality rate amongst um, People have been vaccinated and the, the latest round of numbers that I saw was 0.004%. I'm not talking about point Gentlemen, I hate to interrupt you, but we are out of time and we got to save our poor editor from adding to edit too much of this. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. We want to thank you. Be here next week and we, we might be back in the studio, so that might be nice. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and the Libertarian Counterpoint Show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. Please visit us at http colon slash slash www.libertariancounterpoint.com We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint Productions.